Good morning. This is a special session of the Michigan Supreme Court to address an emergency election matter, Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution versus Secretary of State and Board of Canvassers. I know most of you here, are, however, are here today to recognize the 182nd birthday of this court. <laughs> On July 18th of 1836, Michigan's first governor, Stevens T. Mason, appointed our first three justices who together compromised our, comprised our first court. Uh, William Fletcher, George Morrell, and um, Epaphroditus Ransom. Uh, Justice Fletcher was our first Chief Justice. Justice Morrell was our first and only Justice of French Huguenot descent. And Justice Ransom was our first and only Epaphroditus. <laughs> exactly 182 years ago. Um, thank you all for being here to recognize that occasion. Um, but in addition, today there will be 30 minutes of argument per side in the underlying case that we're hearing. Each side will also have a five-minute free fire period that may or may not be waived. Appellants may also, if they choose, reserve a reasonable amount of time for response but it is uh, your obligation both to request this time and to keep track of it. And finally, I would emphasize that your arguments, I believe, are likely to prove most helpful to this court if you recognize that the justices are knowledgeable about the facts and the background of this case and that you should proceed as directly as possible to the relevant constitutional and legal issues while avoiding those that are not relevant. Just as our court's preparations have been expedited, ex expedited for this hearing, we appreciate that each of you has also had to do the same. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for your preparation. And thank you all in this courtroom, public and media, for being here with us this morning. Let us now proceed with the arguments from Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, may it please the court, uh, for the record, I am Peter Ellsworth, and I'm representing uh, Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution and two individual plaintiffs. Um, it has been 85 years, a little over 85 years, since this court uh, recognized that there is a distinction between amendments pursuant to what now is Article 12, Section 2, and revisions of the Constitution pursuant to what now is Article 12, Section 3. Uh, it was really a doctrine that originated in Michigan, uh, notwithstanding the fact that in uh, several of the briefs, and I think the Court of Appeals said this too, uh, that um, this uh, uh, distinction has been borrowed from California law or at least out of state law. That's not true. Uh, this uh, uh, dis uh, distinction was recognized by this court uh, in 1932, in the case of Kelly versus Lang, and then again in 1933, the following year in the uh, Pontiac School case. And the test that was applied 10 years ago by the Court of Appeals in the Ringen case, the reformed uh, Michigan government now case, uh, the qualitative and quantitative test, that's something too that came uh, from Michigan law. The, the, the words that the Supreme Court used in 1932 were a little bit different. The concept would be the same. I'm sorry, I meant to bring this uh, up. I think the court, in explaining its uh, decision in 1932 in the Kelly versus Lane case, uh, said that uh, its, its decision was dictated by both the number of changes uh, and the result upon the form of government. So these are not new concepts, and they are concepts that uh, were present uh, in 1960 and 61 when the uh, delegates convened in Lansing for the Constitutional Convention that led to the Constitution that we currently are uh, living under. So Kelly versus Lang, I think, supplies the framework for this case. Um, and the, um, I hope that the court will uh, utilize that framework uh, in terms of analyzing the issues in the case. Uh, under this distinction, amendments under Article, uh, Section 2 of Article 12 were, were meant to be, I think in the words of this court, corrections of detail, not, not detailed 
uh, revisions of, of, uh, of large parts of the Constitution. This vo uh, voters uh, and not politicians' uh, proposal is, is certainly not that. It goes on for seven and a half pages of eight-point type, uh, something that no petition signer on the street is going to be able to look at. And I'm sorry, I, I meant to, uh, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, to ask that I, I reserve five minutes or more if I've got it for um, uh, rebuttal. That's and fine. also, I want to yield five minutes to Solicitor General um, Lindstrom. Um, uh, so this proposal is, uh, is anything but short and simple. It's a very lengthy proposal, and it's a very uh, detailed proposal. It would create a super agency combining executive, legislative, and to some extent judicial uh, functions with virtually no checks and balances. Uh, this agency would be responsible to nobody but itself. That includes uh, no responsibility to the people because the, the right of initiative and referendum is being surrendered here in this proposal. Uh, and it would be given absolute control over this very important function of, of drawing legislative district lines. It is truly a radical departure from what we uh, have had over the years in Michigan. The Court of Appeals in its decision below tried to characterize this uh, new super agency as, as just a recreation of what uh, the Constitution set up in 1962. Uh, nothing could really be further from, from the truth. The 1962 uh, reapportionment commission uh, had several important differences. First of all, in terms of the composition of the commission, uh, the commission that was created in 1961 and 62, um, uh, the, the members of the commission were selected by political parties. Redistricting, and we, we have to admit that redistricting is a political process. And in 1961, the delegates uh, recommended to the people that political parties uh, pick the, the eight members of the, of the commission. Uh, the Van Peek uh, Commission, on the other hand, uh, it's ostensibly a nonpartisan commission, but the, the, the members of the commission self-identify as either Republicans or Democrats or something else. There's no check on this. We have no party registration in Michigan, so it's going to be hard to tell if we truly have um, a nonpartisan, uh, bipartisan commission. Mr. Ellsworth, you talked about uh, some of our precedents. Do you think there are any precedents that are binding on this court in respect to the question that's been presented to us? I'm sorry, Justice Viviano. Do you think there are any precedents that are binding on this court? In other words, is Kelly versus Lang or the school district of the city of Pontiac case? Are those binding precedents? Well, I think it's, it's, it's the precedent that sets the framework. Uh, now, you ob obviously have to, to apply uh, the framework to the facts in the case. So it doesn't necessarily dictate the outcome, but I think unless, unless well, the court but my, I think in terms of construing the constitutional language that's at issue, I think you would agree our focus is on the ordinary understanding of the language that was used as it would be understood by those who ratified uh, the Constitution. You'd agree with that, right? Yes. And that we're looking to see if, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the language in a minute, but uh, you started with the cases, and uh, your opponents argue, for example, that Kelly versus Lang, the language in, the, in that case that discusses the distinction between a revision and an amendment is dicta. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, and uh, the following uh, case was the Pontiac Schools case, which well, did before, not... Before we move on, I, I want to I focus on Kelly, because I agree with you. Kelly came, and then nine months later, the, the city of Pontiac case followed. But in Lang, there was a holding in the case already that the amendment was not valid and should not go on the ballot. And then the court proceeded to talk about uh, the distinction between a revision and an amendment, and of course not in the constitutional context, but in the context of the Pontiac City Charter. So I, I just want to I want to be clear. I, I understand your argument to be that you you believe that case is, is persuasive in setting up a framework for us to address the question that's presented to us. But I, I just I don't see how it could be binding on us in light of the fact that it appears to be dicta and it appears to address a city charter and not the state constitution. Well, I think the concept is the, is the same, and of course the Pontiac case that came later uh, did consider the constitutional uh, issue, but there were two issues in the Kelly versus Lane case. One was 
uh, with respect to this number of different amendments that, that were originally proposed. Uh, I think 30 some or something like that because they were trying to get rid of the city manager designation and, and all of these things and they were all to be voted on individually. That was one issue in the case and then the other issue was with respect to the form of the government that was being changed. It was going, the proposal was to go from a, uh, a city manager system to a, to a city commission system. So there were two issues in the case, and I think I, I don't think it's I don't think with respect to the second issue that that was dicta. Let me ask you this. Respect. Let me ask you this before we move on from Kelly versus Lang. In the second portion of the opinion, where it, where it addressed this issue, it went on to suggest, although admittedly in summary fashion, how it might apply the rule that it was discussing to the amendments that were proposed uh, in that case, and in particular, it addressed. Um, the proposal to change to increase the number of city commissioners from five to nine and to change their districts to do some redistricting right to change from a district system to a ward system and the court said there that those changes would merely be a change of detail and therefore an amendment is that something that should concern this court in terms of looking at your well, I think that's correct. I think I think simply changing the number of districts and, and redrawing the lines that that would be a correction of detail, but but what's important in that case is that the changes that were that were being proposed were much more fundamental. It was a change in the in the, in the type of government that 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 Bay City was going to have. That was the change I think that that the court was concerned about. Mr. Ellsworth, could I get back to this standard for just a moment? And in other words, to follow up on what just Justice Viviano has been pursuing. Um, we're all looking, I think, at the basic uh, same the same universe of cases. Um, one talks about looking at the result upon the form of government, another about the modification of the operations of government, another about whether fundamental change is being affected, another about the scope of uh, uh, proposed changes. My question to you is, are any of those standards, some kind of uh, consolidation of those standards or the individual application of those standards, can they, in your judgment, be fairly derived from the language of the Constitution in addition to being derived from the precedence of, of the judiciary? I think that the, if you look at the language in Article 12, Section 2, I think it's something like six times, maybe seven times, that the word amendment in the singular appears. I think that's one textual indication that an amendment was expected to be something that was simple and short uh, and not, not a rewrite of the basic uh, constitutional document. And by contrast? Uh, a revision uh, was something that was uh, clearly meant to be something that, that, that was more fundamental in nature and, and did uh, affect a, a, a more a fundamental change in the government. And let me just go back, because I think this will illustrate the point. Let me go back. I started to, to talk about this 1961 commission, and there were important distinctions. And the first distinction is that that 1961-62 commission came out of a constitutional convention. And if you look at the constitutional debates, uh, uh, almost 250 pages in the debates were devoted to that subject, what kind of a commission to have and what kind of redistricting system uh, there was to be. That's 8%, roughly 8% of, of all of the debates in those big two, uh, uh, blue books that we all uh, look at. I think that's an, that's an indication that it's, a, that it's a change that requires a, a deliberative body to look at it. Secondly, and I think this is the most important distinction between the 62 Commission and, and what's being proposed today, is that the 62 Commission had very, very detailed criteria, rules, standards that it was to apply. Uh, it, was a, it was a commission, an administrative agency, but it was given very clear standards. This agency would not be given clear standards. Uh, in 1982, this Council, court... isn't that just more of a detail? Just, I'm sorry, Justice... Oh, no problem. Good morning. Isn't that just more of a detail? A detail? Yes. No, I think that's, uh, to me, that's the most important distinction. We have what's being proposed here is an agency with enormous power, uh, it's composed of lay people who aren't even supposed to have political experience, and they're not given detailed rules with respect to how to redistrict. Um, that's the distinction. In 1982, this court uh, had to declare the formulas that were in the 1962 Constitution unconstitutional under federal law. Uh, 
When it did that, it, it said we can't keep the, the commission in place because we can't have, it would be unthinkable to keep a, an administrative agency in place to uh, engage in this. But council, doesn't the structure already exist? The structure of? The commission exists in the Constitution? Uh, well, it's on the face of the Constitution, but the Supreme Court in 1982 said it couldn't exist. But that doesn't and, mean, but council, that doesn't, but does that mean it's withdrawn from the Constitution? It's still in the Constitution, correct? Well, uh, effectively it is not, because this court said it couldn't exist without detailed redistricting criteria, which at that point it didn't have. But if the court were to rule differently, wouldn't it just snap back and then become operational immediately? This is a different agency that's being proposed. It's different in terms of the composition. It's different in terms of, of its autonomy. The from structure and the format of the agency are written and currently exist in the Constitution. And Wouldn't this just simply deal with an operational status, which would ultimately be a detail, right? No, this is, a, this is a different agency that's being proposed. It's selected differently. Uh, it has different standards. It, 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 it can set its own budget. Uh, it has autonomy from the rest of state government. That's not the way that the 61, uh, 62 commission was established. Mr. Ellsworth, following on Justice Bernstein's uh, uh, point, if we accept the case law that's been developed and we have to make a determination of whether this is an amendment or a revision. What is our starting point? Is our starting point the text of the Constitution, even though a portion of it was deemed to be unconstitutional? Or is the starting point the structure that is in place currently that has been dealing with redrawing district lines for the past 36 years? Well, I. And, and, and then why? why? What supports your answer? Well, I, I think you always have to start with the, the text of the Constitution, but here we have this unusual situation where the text of the Constitution has been found by this court to be unconstitutional under, under federal law. So we have to look at what is, in, what is in place right now and how this system is functioning with the, functioning with the legislature, uh, drawing the districts according to the detailed criteria that this court came up with in 1982 and, and gave to special masters in, in 1982 and again in 1992. So that's what we have in, in place right now, and I think you, you start with that and you look at the change that's being uh, offered from uh, that point on. Um, so are we comparing for revision versus amendment, are we comparing the current system or the text of the Constitution? I think we're comparing the current system. Okay. Mr. Ellsworth, let me go back to my earlier question because I, I'm still wondering what, what limitations there are on the initiative power that are in the Constitution itself. I do think we have to look at the, the language of the Constitution. I think we all would agree with that. And that's why I was asking you whether there was any binding precedents that helped us to understand that language. I heard you mention that, and I agree with you, that several times the relevant provisions refer to amendment in the singular, and that may be a limitation. Um, but my question is, how do we get from uh, that limitation that you may be suggesting to what I think is the California test? You mentioned people be laying as, as the, the test originating in that case, but that case actually cites an early California precedent for that test. So it, it appears that we have followed uh, California, at least the Court of Appeals has in the last 10 years, um, and people be laying did you know, about 85 years ago. But, my question is, you know, I studied very closely another case that you worked on uh, before our court, the Michigan United case, where the court talked about the powers of direct, direct democracy and how the people had retained and reserved that power to themselves in the 1908 Constitution, um, that they had done so essentially because they weren't happy with the way the legislature was functioning. So they wanted to take some power away from the legislature and, and retain that power. And this court said in Michigan United that it was going to respect those powers that the people had reserved to themselves in the Constitution, but that it was also going to enforce any clear limitations on those powers that the people themselves had placed. And in that case, it talked about uh, limiting uh, uh, the referendum power when there was an act making an appropriation for state institutions. And you were successful in that case in, in persuading this court that that express limitation should be enforced. I'm struggling to find a similar express limitation 
in this case, and I've, I've looked at the 63 debates, and I don't think there's much debate on this point, and so I looked back at the 1908 debates where there was a lot more debate about this power and helping us understand the nature of this power. Um, and at that time, there was a suggestion, I think, from uh, uh, one of the, the framers that they anticipated that pretty much every amendment would make its way onto the ballot. And so I'm, I'm struggling to, to find the type of limitation that you're talking about, the California limitation, the qualitative quantitative limitation in the language of the Constitution. Well, I think it was, um, it, it was, uh, there was no direct textual um, indicator in the Kelly versus Lane case either. The, the Supreme Court simply noted that you can't, you can't revise the form of government uh, by a simple amendment. In the Michigan United Conservation case, it was really kind of a simple issue because the, the Constitution says you can't have a, a, a referendum on a, on a measure, a bill that appropriates money. And the, uh, the debate uh, within this court was on what the word appropriation means, and uh, Justice Young and the majority were simply saying there, there's, only one, there's only one interpretation because there's only one, one word. So I, it seems to me that the, that the distinction that you, that you need to look at is whether uh, what's being proposed is something that, that needs the, the work of a deliberative body uh, something other than a simple amendment that goes on the ballot that people can quickly understand, they can see it in the, in the petition and they can see it otherwise, versus a, a very detailed, complex uh, change in the way that the government, the, uh, the way that the government functions. I'm, I'm if, sympathetic to your point about the need for deliberation. That's why I work on a deliberative body. That's why I like our Republican form of government. But. I'm wondering whether my personal feelings matter or whether, or actually, I'm actually not wondering, I'm pretty sure it's the feelings of the people who ratified the Constitution, the language that matters. And I'm trying to understand what they were thinking about in 1908. And I, I guess I ask you one, one follow-up question, which is, it appears in 1908 there was a limitation on uh, uh, what could be proposed as an amendment. There was a procedure whereby that would go before the legislature a deliberative body, and the framers again recognized that this would allow for debate and for refinement of language and coordination with other laws, and this was thought to be a, an appropriate safeguard in 1908 for this type of deliberation. And then five years later, that was eliminated um, from the Constitution, that, that deliberative safeguard. Well, and so I'm just, I'm struggling when our, our ratifiers took that action to understand how they could have thought sort of in a hidden or language that's hard to divine. It's taken us 110 years to try to untangle. They actually had the much more robust safeguard in mind that they never mentioned in the, in the debates, and it's not clearly expressed in the language. How, how, do, we, how do we divine that? Well, I was Mr. Mr. delegate, Mr. Ellsworth, before you respond, let me say your time is now being taken away either from the solicitor or from your response. Yes, and I, if I could maybe come back to that. We have a lot of time today. So we if can. we look at Mr. Hutchinson's, Delegate Hutchinson's comments in, in the ConCon, but thank you, uh, Your Honor. I, uh, let me uh, step down because I want to, I don't want to well, you're not going to answer to Justice Vivian's question. question. I don't, we're, we're here for, right? yeah, we, 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 I, I don't have anywhere else to go. I'd like to hear the answer to the question. Yeah, I can assure you you'll have plenty of time, and so will everyone today to speak on this topic. First, first, of, all, first of all, I think that the, uh, the delegates to the, to the Constitutional Convention had to be aware of the Kelly versus Lang and the, and the Pontiac School in cases when they wrote the Constitution. In 1963. In 1963. But you, you wouldn't suggest that by 1963, the terms amendment and revision had become legal terms of art, would you, based on Kelly versus Lang? I think that they were. I think that, that was the understanding of the delegates. And you can look at the, at the remarks of Delegate Hutchinson, one of the leaders of the, of the 63 Con Con, 62 Con Con, uh, when he made remarks to that effect on the, on the floor of the Constitution, the importance of, of having a deliberative body look at these more extensive changes. Um, I, I do want to- He referred to our case law? I, I'm sorry? He referred to our case law? Uh, I don't know that he did refer to the case law specifically. I, I don't think he did. So let me yield now to uh, Mr. Lindstrom, and then I'd like a few minutes so of rebuttal. That, that's I, the answer to the question? 
I, I'm sorry, Justice Bernstein. Is that, the, is that the totality of your answer? Is that the answer to Justice Aviano's question? Yes. Okay. Good morning, Aaron Lindstrom, on behalf of the Attorney General. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I'd like to start briefly by talking about how it is fundamental, and then I'd like to talk about the test. So as to why this is a fundamental change, the, provo the proposal is a revision because it would alter three basic concepts that are fundamental to the structure of our government, and that's the separation of powers, the checks and balances, and the fact that we elect those who exercise legislative power. I know your time is short, Mr. Lindstrom, but you, 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 uh, you I, I have to, why, why, where do I pull fundamental out of the language of the Constitution? Why, why does the Constitution give seven of us a judicial veto over something the people have decided they want to vote on? Mm -hmm. Vote on. We're not, we don't have to say whether it's good or bad. Why, why, where in the Constitution do I get to say that as a judge I get to determine if something's fundamental or not and tell the people they can't vote on it? So I, I don't see the language. Text and structure. So the text point Where's would be the. the I'd start with a common understanding: the words amendment and revision. So those had a common understanding, and this court specifically, in People versus Alger, recognized that in the 1908 convention, it was fair to assume that the people of the convention knew about prior cases, right? So People versus Lang says that in People versus Alger. People versus Lang established that there was a common understanding of what amendment versus revision meant. And the fact that it relied on sources from around the country just establishes that, that, wide, that the difference was widely understood in the specific area of changing a fundamental document that amendment. Do you amendment, see Lang as binding precedent? I'm not saying it's binding. I'm saying that it's evidence and strong evidence of what the common understanding would have been in 1963. It's, it's strong evidence of that. Again, I'd like to show this language from People versus Alger because I think it's directly on point. People versus Alger, in addition to talking about the fact that it matters that there's the term amendment and revision has a different voting standard, which shows there's a structural difference. It also said it's significant that the members of the con convention who framed the Constitution in 1908 must have had in mind these cases that established the point that was the issue in that case. So, so you really think the people wanted to give seven ju justices the authority to decide what's fundamental and what's not? I mean, you, you know as well as I do that fundamental is in the eye of the beholder, right? It's, I, this just allows such subjective decision making on the part of seven justices to shut something down. Why don't we get the court out of this business? Let the people decide. I think the people impose two avenues, and so the court has to decide which of those avenues is appropriate. Sometimes the people do use broad language. The Fourth Amendment says something has to be reasonable or unreasonable, and that's decided by the court. The structural difference here is that when you do something that's an amendment, what you get out of the process is an amendment, as it says in Section 2, to this Constitution. What you get out of the convention process, if you go through a revision, is you get either amendments or a new Constitution. So that shows or that there's either. a change. Or either, any of the above. They, they seem to be two different processes. I get that. And so My, you have to follow two different structures for the different processes. Sure. But I still don't see why they, they get there's something substantively different out of either of them from the text of the Constitution. Right. And the text I'm pointing is that you can only get a new Constitution out of the second one shows out of Section 3, you can only get a new constitution out of that. A general and that revision, shows, right, right. Well, that shows that it's broader in scope. I think a general revision has to be broader in scope than an amendment. I agree with that. Right. Yeah. So if it is true that revisions are broader in scope and have to be, if something's broad, it has to be done through revision, and if an amendment is, as this court said in Lang, relying on the basic meaning of the word amendment, that it's something that's smaller, which is also consistent with the fact that you do amendments one by one. So smaller versus broader is the same as fundamental versus less fundamental, I guess? Is that the? I think when you're talking about these structural protections that are about how we're going to change our government, then it, fundamental is a natural way to think about it. That's the way this court thought about it previously, as we said. And again, the fact that it's not a bright line rule doesn't mean that it's not this court's job to enforce that there is a difference between three and two. And the difference between three and two has to do with scope. Otherwise, as this court explained in Alger, why would there be a voting difference between the two? But if counsel, you do your, your position, your position to me is quite startling and is quite concerning. And the reason that it's startling to me is because your position and your argument really takes away the ability for the voters to have a say 
if we were to ultimately adopt what is in your brief and what you are arguing here today, this could create a standard that could be very difficult for people to amend their government. It just surprises me that your office would take such a stance that would be so against people. Help me to understand how the position that you're taking, you're here by choice, you're making your argument, you submitted your brief, really simply belies the fact that you don't feel that people should have a ability to have a voice in their government. Uh, not at all, Justice Bernstein. I explain to me how, because if, sure. I, if we adopt your standard, it's going to be very difficult, not just on this issue, but on other issues, for people to propose amendments using the standard that you created. I'm just surprised that you don't really have a faith in the people. Your Honor, we do have faith in the people. We think that the people can make this change. The people have decided that they are going to establish two separate processes, mm -hmm. and we're just effectuating the processes that people have already expressed but you're, their you're, will you're on. you're equating a constitutional convention which can happen once every 16 years to an amendment process where people are able to ultimately have their voice heard by gathering signatures and discussing the issues and, and putting their issues forward. I mean, ultimately, the, the, the second vehicle that you are proposing, which would be that this has to go through constitutional convention, is something that for all intents and purposes is simply unattainable. So at the end of the day, Shouldn't we be concerned about our property tax, about other issues, that basically if your argument is upheld by this court today, will make it very difficult for the citizens to be able to have ultimately their voice represented or heard on the ballot? Or alternatively, it just gives the court an awful lot of power. You really want this court to have that much power? So as to the first part of the question, uh, the people have already established this. There's been four, at least, <laughs> four constitutions, so the Constitutional Convention process has happened. The people can call a Constitutional Convention if they want to. By how, how do we call? That passes. So, well, hold on. Let's, let's kind of get real here. How are people going to call a Constitutional Convention? I mean, seriously, I mean, are you really equating that to a ballot initiative in, in terms of a separate vehicle that the voters have? I mean, come on. I mean, if you want to take that position, I'll, I'll respect that, but I just want you to say it. So if you read Section 3 of Article 12 about a revision, it says that it may be occurred at such times as provided by law. So the people through an initiative can call a convention based on the plain text of Section 3. I think that's uh, just what the text says. So it may be harder to do, but the point that it's hard to do might be consistent with the fact that it's ending up with a new constitution. If you have you know, set aside the three branches, now you have one branch, that is able to exercise on the express language of this proposal, the legislative, executive, and judicial power, and then it's free from the checks and balances. I've exceeded my time, and I don't want to no, destroy no, his we're not done yet. Don't, Can I don't ask one, worry. <laughs> I know I have one, one follow-up before you go, too. One of the concerns that I have about a fundamental you know, power test, or, or the one that you're suggesting, in addition to the, the fact that I think it's hard to derive from the text of the Constitution, is that you're casting too wide of a net. In other words, if we look back on our history, how many of the amendments that have been proposed and went on the ballot, and even those that have been passed and are now law, would your test uh, sweep up as things that should not have gone on the ballot? And, and what, some that come to mind, and I haven't studied all of them yet, I'm sort of in the middle of looking at that issue, but uh, is, for example, the Civil Service Commission. Under your test, would that be uh, allowed on the ballot as an amendment in the way that it was proposed in 1940? That would be allowed, but it doesn't alter any of the vesting clauses. It's still subject to checks and balances. The governor appoints. For example, the legislature has a veto power on the rates that are set. This doesn't alter. It has an awful lot of autonomy, doesn't it? I mean, it may have a lot of autonomy, but it doesn't have judicial power, and it doesn't have legislative power in the same way. I mean, it exercises it? some judicial power, right? They, do, they resolve some employee disputes, do they not? I think they exercise administrative adjudication. I don't think this court has described that as judicial power. It's still a res staff resolved on appeal through it. But they have a whole staff of people that work for them, and they investigate issues across the state, and they do adjudicate. So let me and ask those you, are there, any other, are there any others that you think would be swept up in your test that you would call into question 
as improper amendments based on the test you're proposing now because a whole host of amendments have all have been directed at changing the structure of government, reducing the legislative power. I mean, that was a new reason for the whole initiative process by itself. Um, taking away appropriations power from the legislature, but the whole reason we had a constitution, one of them, a constitutional convention in 1963, is because uh, there was so much uh, high percentage of earmarks. 70% of the state's budget was already earmarked because of these initiatives. So the, 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 are there any, I guess I'm just wondering if you, if you believe any others would be swept up or if this test was, would, only be, would only address what's before us today? I don't think the others would be swept up, not because we're adopting a test that is for this case only, but because what's happening in this proposal is a much bigger change than these other ones. I mean, it does expressly change the vesting clauses for all three branches, and it expressly says that it's going to have judicial power, executive power, and legislative power, and it's expressly designed to make it independent which means to free it from checks and balances. And I don't think any of the previous examples of amendments that have occurred have had that sort of effect. And it's also taking away the ability for people to vote for the officials that are gonna be on this new commission, right? The people never will have the ability to elect who's on the commission or even to elect did the they people have that, that power, appoint them. Did they have that power under the 63? Uh, under the 63 apportionment Constitution? commission, they at least have the ability to influence it through a political party. You're right, it can't be directly appointed. So there's at least some way to influence it. Here, it's a random selection process. Now, that may be a good process, but or I'm it saying may, it's a big it not, change. Or it may not be. But that's it may not, not be. That's not, really that's not the question. question, but it's a big change, which is what our point is. This would be you know, a deviation from the usual democratic representative process that we have. I mean, there were fairly elaborate members. restrictions under the 63 Constitution, right? Eligibility to membership. No officers or employees of the federal, state, or local governments, except notaries and members. There were limitations, and I'm not saying that all limitations go to fundamental points. I'm saying that the limitations that are being eliminated here do go to fundamental points. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Lindstrom. Thank you. We're going to hear briefly from the Secretary of State, is that correct? Good morning, Assistant Attorney General Heather Meingas on behalf of Defendant Secretary of State Ruth Johnson and Defendant State Board of Kansas. Very quickly, because I know I'm not the attorney you want to hear from, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Crabtree shortly. As the court knows, um, the state defendants do not necessarily have a legal position on the questions, the important questions before the court. However, we are interested and affected by, by the order. Um, as the court is aware, the board has certified the VNP proposal as sufficient. We did that on June 20th. That was pursuant to the Court of Appeals mandamus order, which had immediate effect. That means we really only have two duties left to execute with respect to this proposal. Um, the Director of Elections needs to, um, to craft the ballot summary that needs to be approved by the Board of Canvassers. And all of this needs to be certified by the Secretary of State by September 7th. So with that said, my point here today is simply to urge the, excuse me, urge the court to resolve this matter um, by early August, if possible, around the time of the primary, so that our clients can go about the rest of their duties, do the ballot language, which in itself could be challenging and may also engender additional litigation. So that's uh, our position. If there's any questions, otherwise, I'm turned over to you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Could the crier please start the uh, clock over so that we can focus on the substantive argument, please? Good morning. May it please the court, I'm Graham Crabtree, appearing on behalf of uh, voters, not politicians, also referred to for short as simply VNP. Uh, the proposal at issue here today was crafted with meticulous attention to trying to avoid the abrogation issues that the court is not focusing on today. And uh, after that was taken care of, it was supported by more than 390,000 valid petition signatures. But in, in spite of all that care, uh, challenges have been raised. The request has been made to keep this all of, off of the ballot by way of mandamus. And thus, I am privileged to be able to appear before you today to wish you happy birthday. <laughs> um, the case law of this state is very clear. The issuance of a writ of mandamus is an extraordinary remedy. Plaintiffs have the burden of proving entitlement to that remedy, and it is a very heavy burden under Michigan law. Although legal questions presented here are reviewed de novo, the grant or denial of mandamus is reviewed for abuse of discretion, as the uh, plaintiffs have correctly acknowledged. Uh, 
But most importantly, uh, this court's precedents require this court to liberally construe the pertinent constitutional and statutory provisions to facilitate rather than impede the free exercise of the people's reserved right to propose constitutional amendments by voter initiative. Therefore, this court should be unwilling to exclude VNP's proposal from the ballot based upon any insubstantial, contrived, or exaggerated claims. Uh, we have suggested in our briefs and suggest to you again today, the Court of Appeals has carefully considered all of these issues and has properly denied the plaintiff's request. We will ask this court to uh, deny it as well. Um, because we are, we are focusing on the question of revision or amendment, I'll move directly to that and I'll welcome any questions at this point that, the, that any of you may care to ask me. Um, I think it was appropriate to start out with the discussion of Kelly versus Lang because that is one of the two cases that uh, the Court of Appeals relied upon as providing authority for its decision in Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution. Uh, I, I think Justice Viviano was hitting the head on the nail on the head when he suggested that the, the discussion of that issue really was dicta because it was not necessary to the court's holding, which was that the, the matter couldn't go on the ballot because uh, the proposal proposed separate votes on 13 different things, and that was not appropriate under the governing provisions of the Home Rule Act. And the, the controversy in that case did involve the Home Rule Act, not the Michigan Constitution. Um, so the court then went on to address another issue that had been raised, uh, the question of whether this could qualify as a revision or an amendment. And it expressed some generalizations, I think, that might, might apply with some validity when you are talking about what is the difference between an amendment and a revision in general. Um, so I, I can't really take issue with some of the things that the court said in Kelly versus Lang. Um, the court said, revision and amendment have the common characteristics of working changes in the charter and are sometimes used inexactly. Revision implies a re-examination of the whole law and a redraft without obligation to ma maintain the form, scheme, or structure of the old. And it went on to say, as, as applied to fundamental law, such as a constitutional charter, it suggests a convention to examine the whole subject and to prepare and submit a new instrument. Um, a short time later in the city of Pontiac case, um, there was, a, there was a, a claim made that the constitutional amendment in, at issue in that case con should have constituted a general revision. And uh, the court rejected that claim, but without much discussion of the reason for its, of its holding. It, the discussion of that issue takes up about uh, a paragraph, and so it really does not lend, uh, doesn't shed a whole lot of light on what we have today. Mr. I have asked Mr. Mr. Court, Mr. Uh, could, could you just dispel my confusion. You're urging us to affirm the decision of the Court of Appeals, yet you seem to have some reservations about the standard they applied in assessing this distinction between amendments and revisions. If I'm correct in what I'm saying here, can you tell me precisely what standard you would apply to differentiate these concepts? Well, I have, I have suggested, uh, first of all, with the, the, the standard that was applied below. They, they addressed the qualitative versus quantitative because they had to. They were bound by that. This court is not. But I, I think it's really not necessary to even go there at this point because your, your obligation is to look at what the language of the Constitution provides. And that's why I have directed your attention to the constitutional language. Article 12 provides three different ways of amending the Constitution. There can be a joint uh, resolution of the legislature that will put the question on the ballot, which then has to be approved by the people. Um, Article 2, amendments may be proposed by voter-initiated petition. Number 3, the Constitution may be amended by way of a constitutional convention. And it speaks of not just a revision, but a general revision, which I think is consistent with the discussion that we find in Kelly versus Lang. It contemplates a look at the entire Constitution, and, and, it, and it, I think it's pretty obvious what that was intended to accomplish when you just look at the language of the Constitution. Uh, it provides an, an opportunity every 16 years 
for the people to vote on whether they think it's time to have an overhaul of the entire Constitution. Now, if they are in favor of that, they'll vote in favor of it, and then there will be a subsequent election, a partisan election, which will elect delegates. And uh, if you review the convention record, you see the, the, the two big volumes of the last convention. This went on for 170 some days, the better part of a year. And they did look at the entire Constitution and, uh, and redrafted much of it, came up with a whole new Constitution, which the people then had to approve. That's what a general revision is all about. Counsel, There's Counsel I don't mean to harangue you, but I'm still confused. Okay. Assuming we're not talking about the once in every 16 years when we have to look at a top to bottom <coughs> revampment of the Constitution, mm -hmm. Are there ever any circumstances under which this court can look at some, something that proposes to be an amendment and say, no, it's not. It is not acceptable under the constitutional language to allow this to be on the ballot in light of Article 12 and its guidance? Well, I think uh, not according to the constitutional language. However, there are authorities which I've cited which have shed some light on what is, word, what is meant by the term amendment. And I've suggested to the court that they're focusing on a different question. This is not a question of whether this might be considered a revision. It's a question, can it be considered an amendment under Article 12, Section 2? And the, the cases that I've cited to you talk about what an amendment is. An amendment can amend several sections of the Constitution, and it, and it can be long and involved, as long as it addresses a single overall purpose or subject, and as long as the various changes proposed are germane to the accomplishment of that purpose. Once again, what is the standard that we apply? You say we look at the Constitution. I think we all understand that. No one disagrees. Mm -hmm. Of course we look to the Constitution, and of course we take the proposal under consideration and lay it alongside mm -hmm. that Constitution. Having done that, having laid these two things alongside each other, what is the question we ask in terms of whether or not that proposal must or must not be placed on the ballot. What is the standard? What is the test? I think the standard is the, is the standard that, that I just mentioned to you set out in this court's case law. Is, does, is it an amendment? Can it properly be considered an amendment because it addresses one singular purpose or subject? And the court will look further to say, are all the various proposed changes germane to that one subject? And so, so, uh, so you think the only limiting language the Constitution gives us is a single purpose or a sole purpose, however, however you want to, however you want to put it. That's that's I, the only way we can. Distinguish I think so, and and, and, and I and I don't quarrel with what the, the Court of Appeals did in Citizens Protecting Our Constitution. That that our MGN petition made a wide, broad range of changes, unrelated changes. And there's no way in the world that that could have been called No, I agree with amendment. you. If you're, if you're correct that the standard is single purpose or sole purpose, then that provision, the 2008 um, a, amendment, mm -hmm. might, would have failed your test. Is that, it, would you agree It would have that? failed that test, as, as would the, the proposed revision of the Bay City Charter in, uh, in Kelly versus Lang. You know, in, in Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution, about three pages of the court's opinion taking up but just by making a list of all the unrelated things that that proposal would have done. Um, in Kelly versus Lang, the, the list wasn't quite that long, but it, it amended, it, it would have changed a number of different aspects of the city government that were unrelated to each other. In this case, so, so yes, there, there may be an occasion where a multifarious proposed amendment might be deemed inappropriate for submission as an amendment. And it would but, be, in your view, if it has more than one purpose. That's, that's, the, that's the single limitation you think if you'd, it has, be, you'd be comfortable with this court adjudicating. If it adjudicating. has more than one overall purpose or object, yes. Um, I think what is being done here, though, is there's an attempt to parse out portions of what has been proposed and say, well, we, have, we object to this part of it and this part of it and this part of it. They, I haven't heard them say that they aren't all related to the objection or the uh, overall objective of reforming redistricting in Michigan. And uh, 
it does, you know, another thing that has been you know, said, is, is, this, uh, is this something that is within the original lines of the Constitution? Um, clearly not, if you have a number of different unrelated subjects or objections. So, um, uh, under your proposal, can there be an amendment put on the ballot to go from a bicameral legislature to a unilateral uh, legislature? I think that could be that could be done, could be Your done. Honor. Yes, I mean, and that is because the, the Constitution is very clear that the uh, the people are the source of all governmental power, and they and they have the ability to define how the government is going to be set up, however they choose. They can do they could do that by way of the next constitutional convention, or they could do it by way of a voter initiated petition. That's that's that would be an important change certainly. And the, the changes that are being proposed by VNP's proposal are certainly important changes. They're all within the lines of what is already out there in Article 4, Section 6, primarily. Um, the changes are rather extensive, but you know the bulk of the changes are set forth in a single section of the existing Article 4. Um, there, are, the problem with the, this qualitative, quantitative test that's being proposed is. Um, not only is there no support for that in the language of the Constitution, but it provides no, no workable standard whatsoever. I, worse than that, it actually dresses up a completely subjective standard to make it sound as scientific and objective, which we should at least be honest that it's not if we're right. going to impose a, a, a judicial veto. But let, me, but let me ask you why a sole purpose or single purpose isn't also um, I mean, I, I, I have concerns that single purpose, sole purpose is also in the eye of the beholder and leaves a lot of room for the subjective interpretation of individual judges' you know, views. We, Justice Bernstein and I might disagree about what's, what, what the, how to define the sole purpose of a particular amendment. Why do, you even want, why do you even want to give us that kind of power to crush the will of the people? Just well, I, I don't want to give the court any power to crush the little people, and there, there are some uh, somewhat inconsistent uh, statements out there. The, you know, the city of Jackson versus Sims case and the Graham versus Miller focused on the language of the Constitution. And they said there is, there is no, there's nothing in this Constitution that restricts the subject matter or scope of an amendment. And so I'd be delighted if the court were to, to stick to that. Uh, this is, our Constitution is very different in that regard from the Constitution of, say, uh, California, which does have a very specific provision in there. See, a constitutional amendment shall not address more than one purpose. Our Constitution doesn't have that. But I don't understand what you're saying. I mean, if you're saying that there's nothing in this Constitution, you said this 10 seconds ago, there's nothing in this Constitution that limits the scope of an amendment, why are we getting together here today? There's just no, li there's no possibility that under any circumstance this court has any role whatsoever in this process, right? Is that your real position? Well, I, 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 this court should not have any role in, in throwing this off the ballot, certainly, but if I have to concede something, it would be that if there well, is a question. precisely the issue whether it should be off the ballot because it doesn't live up to what some think are the standards of our Constitution or whether it must be on, on the ballot because it does live up to those standards. I am suggesting, Your Honor, that there could conceivably be a question as to what the meaning of that one word is, amendment. Is and to the extent we have to determine what the, what the people would have understood that meaning to be, I think it is appropriate probably to look at what the court said uh, with respect to single object or purpose. Okay, and let me ask you about that for just a moment mm -hmm. if I could please. Um, is it a sufficient, no one doubts that the people, and they've been referenced many times today, properly and deservedly, but there's no doubt the people can affect the breadth of change they'd like to do. The only question is whether it has to be by this process and procedure or that process and procedure. Is it, a, is it in your view, uh, a fairly expressed, legitimately expressed single purpose that the only thing this amendment would do is to modify the separation of powers by introducing each of the three branches of government clauses by an accept provision, Article 3, accept, Article 4, accept, and Article 5, accept, and then by conferring all those 
branches powers, the executive, the legislative, and judicial power upon a single new governmental agency. Is that fairly described in your view as a single purpose? The only purpose is to modify the separation of powers of our Constitution so that we can have a totally independent and checks and balances free institution making decisions concerning the, um, uh, the redistricting of legislative districts in Michigan. Is that a single power, a single purpose in your view? Well, I, th I think, Your Honor, you've stated the question a little more broadly than maybe it needs to be stated. but. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, this, this is, it has a single overall purpose of reforming the way in which redistricting is done, largely along the lines of uh, what was done in 1963 that the people voted for. Now there are these, these by amendments, these, by these, by accept, these accept as altered or abrogated clauses. We, we've explained in the documents we've attached, that was to try to avoid the alter and abrogation questions that we thought might come up in light of what has happened in recent years. But when you look at what is being altered or abrogated, where is there any executive authority being exercised by this commission? They haven't identified it. Where is the commission exercising well, any I think the tradition? response is why do we introduce the executive branch chapter by suggesting pretty pretty explicitly that there's some alteration of the separation of powers that's being accomplished by this amendment and specifically being imposed upon the executive power of our state. What is the purpose of the, let me ask you in response, what is the purpose of the modification at the very first, in the very first sentence of Article 5 of the Constitution? It's what is to, the purpose it, of it? It is to ensure the continuity and the independence of this commission which is because it is executing a uh, legislative function, it is in the legislative department, it's in the legislature. But it is to make it clear that that, can, that cannot be changed by any action of the executive. The, the, the executive does not have any authority to reassign this by way of an executive order or to do anything really that, at all that will interfere with the commission's performance. That's the whole itself. point. In other words, he can't do things that arguably he can do, he can do today. To That's that the small, extent to which the executive to, power is being modified by that, the amendment. To that small Once again, extent, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's what's being done here. To that small extent, it does clear that up, Your Honor. But I think if you look at what the original uh, provision of the 63 Constitution provides, the executive didn't have any, any role to play in that. That was exclusively a question for the commission set up in the legislature. My larger point, of course, is that the single purpose test is just as open to discretion as any other test that can be applied here. The single purpose test can be uh, accommodating the idea that the single purpose is to modify the separation of powers of the Constitution so that uh, redistricting can be accomplished in a, in a transformed way. Or the single purpose is to modify Articles 4, 5, and 6 of the Constitution, which are the heart of that, of that charter. Or the single purpose is to um, foster good government. It's just as susceptible, is it not, to increasingly broad and increasingly generali generalized statements so that there's literally no check that that offers on anything? Well, I, I think you have to, again, look at what is, what is actually being proposed because we, it, it is, we, are, we are suggesting and have and continue to suggest that it, there is one single overall purpose to this. There are, there are other changes in, in other articles as well. They are germane, all of them, to the accomplishment of this overall purpose. So, we are trying to get and, a standard, though, and, a standard for the next case next year, too, where you may not be in the courtroom to help us. Well, I, is the chief making a pretty good argument that the, the court shouldn't have a role in this at all? If we can't come up with a test derived from the text that limits judicial discretion? Maybe he's making your argument for you. Well, I, I think that would be my, my first argument. If you, if you just look at the, the language of the Constitution, which you should all be loath to read requirements into, um, there is an, a necessity to talk about whether it's a single purpose or not, because that, that's not in the constitutional language. But if you, if you agree that that goes into the construction of that one word amendment, then you do look. Is there a single overall purpose 
and are the various changes germane to the accomplishment of that? And you have to bear in mind the overall function and duty of this court is when you're talking about an effort to deny the people their right to vote on a proposed constitutional amendment, this court interprets the Constitution liberally to facilitate rather than restrict the free exercise of that right. So it does not allow a fine parsing of whether, whether or not this or that is, a, is germane. If, if it can be reasonably argued that it is, then I believe it is the duty of this court to allow that to go on the ballot so that the people can have their say as our constitutional convention and ultimately the people decided. You're taking the position now though that that the single purpose test isn't textually based in the Constitution, is that correct? Well, it's, uh, they, it, th these were decided under the provisions of the 1908 Constitution, which, um, w w which were materially the same as what we have today. But there was a question of what, what is meant by an amendment. Not a revision, not a general revision, certainly. What, what is meant by an amendment? Is this amendment too broad? You know, in, in one of the cases that I've cited for you, I think it was the Jackson versus Nims case, th there was a question of, well, this is way too broad. This, this is something that has to be done by way of legislation. And the court said, no, there's, there's no restriction on the, on the scope of an amendment. But, you know, even if there was, there's, there's this sole purpose, and, and what is being done here is germane to that purpose. So, um, with, with the benefit of hindsight in the standard you're asking us to apply today, would the Remgen petition be on the ballot? Remgen should never have been on the ballot. And, and, and this court, I, I think, um, made the sensible determination that as a practical matter, that was impossible. Uh, the court was reluctant to endorse the legal rationale for citizens protecting Michigan's Constitution, affirmed it in result only, there was some concern, I think, about the, the slippery slope, the lack of any standards, and the potential for that standard to be abused. But, uh, but certainly, that, that, is, that is a proposal that never could have been on the ballot under, under, under any kind of a test. Same thing with the proposal that we had at issue in Kelly versus Lang. But as our Court of Appeals, I think, appropriately pointed out here, this case is nowhere near either of those cases because it does have a single purpose and the things that it proposes to do are changes that are germane to the accomplishment of that single overall purpose. So what is your basis for saying Rimjin would, should never have been on the ballot? Do you have a standard that you'd like to articulate that would support that? I mean, there is a standard uh, that would allow the people to work their will. That's the standard. Rimjin was presumably the people seeking to work their will, just as you believe the current uh, modification uh, satisfies that standard. Why shouldn't Rimjin have been placed on the ballot? Well, if, if, uh, perhaps if we were a constitutional purist, uh, it, maybe it should have been. But I think there is also constitutional language in Article 12, Section 2 that prohibited that. There's a constitutional requirement that the, the, the purpose has to be summarized in 100 words. And when there are 29 different purposes, uh, this court appropriately concluded there, there's no way in the world that could have been summarized in 100 words. So that, that imposes a restriction as a practical matter in addition to any definition of what is meant by an amendment, which I think also could have shot it down. But, but to talk about whether, whether this amendment is too big and long and complicated, you know, the Court of Appeals and Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution took pains to say, we are not saying that something ought to be kept off the ballot just because it's too complex and confusing. Um, that's not what they were about. Uh, how many words are too many words? There's a bar graph in their brief that shows there's a number of words here. Well, how in the world do you come up with a standard about how many words can be included? And what is fundamental? You know, one, one advocate's incidental is another advocate's fundamental. And there's no way of quantifying that or preventing that standard from being abused in the future if this court decides to adhere to it. Well, the United States Supreme Court uh, seems to feel that they've been able to accomplish uh, the, the um, application of the fundamental standard. It's the defining standard for determining whether or not substantive due process 
is or isn't satisfied under the Constitution. It's the standard for determining whether or not the Privileges and Immunities Clause under the 14th Amendment is or isn't satisfied. And it's the operative standard for determining whether or not the Privileges or Immunities Clause under Article 4 is or is not satisfied under the Constitution. So some, by some reason, on some basis, by hook or crook, the United States Supreme Court has felt that the fundamental <laughs> rights analysis the application of the fundamentality uh, test and consideration is, is something that's operative in terms of the most important constitutional issues of our time. There are a great many things that can be called fundamental, Your Honor. I'm sure there are a great many decisions of this court that have said this, uh, this right or that is fundamental, but how is the proposer, the, the petition sponsor going to predict what is going to be ultimately determined to be fundamental or not. We have the same problem that we have with respect to the alter or abrogate issue. And this court has said a number of times, and including most recently in the uh, Protect Our Jobs case, um, that the with respect to the legislation, the legislation, legislature never, per never intended to have to have a petition sponsor go out and get a declaratory ruling ahead of time as to what's altered or abrogated. Are they going to have to do that with respect to what might be considered fundamental? And what is the standard? Uh, I, I believe it was Justice Viviano that asked, aren't there, aren't there some uh, other amendments out there that might be considered fundamental? Certainly they are. I, I mentioned the Headley Amendment. That has made sweeping changes with respect to the way state and local governments operate, and, and it you know, conferred jurisdiction on the Court of Appeals. Very fundamental. That, uh, were, is that something that the people shouldn't have been allowed to vote on? The, the Tish property tax amendment didn't get adopted, but that was very, very complicated. Uh, the, the term limits amendment are, are amended four, four different articles of our Constitution, and it certainly made what I think was a fundamental change with respect to our legislative representation, both in the, in the, in the state legislature and in the Congress, and also in the executive branch. The governor, the attorney general, the secretary of state, they're all limited in how long they can serve, notwithstanding the fact that maybe a lot of people think they're doing a good job. Fundamental change. What about the, the Proposal A property tax amendment? Now, that is something that the legislature put up to vote on, but um, sweeping change there. So um, there's really, there's no way of coming up with a, a satisfactory standard that anyone will be able to understand that will give guidance to people that want to amend the Constitution. And, you know, I've, I've suggested that uh, neither the legislature nor the executive or this court is free to come up with something that is going to unnecessarily curtail or burden the free exercise of the people's right to propose amendments to the Constitution. Um, that was emphasized most recently in the Protect Our Jobs case. I believe Justice Sorrow wrote that opinion. Um, that's in there because it's fundamental. That, that much is fundamental. And that, I think, is something that this court has to bear in mind as it weighs these arguments and decides whether the people can have their right to, uh, to vote on this um, proposed amendment. At the expense of the people having their right to elect representatives and to participate in the legislative process as they've done for two generations. Um, I, I don't believe this infringes that whatsoever, Your Honor. I mean, it, what, it does a very, very narrow thing as, as the original Constitution. It substitutes 13 citizens chosen at random across the state mm -hmm. by a procedure that's not entirely random, and it Im interposes that process in place of one now in which 10 million people have a, a, a direct participation in the process by electing their representatives and senators. Is that not uh, somewhat consequential? Well, it, uh, I suppose the question is whether the people should be trusted to exercise their own power in the fashion they would like or in the fashion that others would like. Is that, well, is that, is that a way of framing the question? They should absolutely be trusted to make these important decisions because there's nothing in the Constitution that it's says they should. It's their power. Isn't that the, with the beginning and the it end is, of it? It is their, their power. power. And, and, and a point that we have made is we're, we're taking this back to what the voters approved in 1963. Now, this court in 1980. I, I don't know what the voters are going to do, but the point is it was their power. They gave it to the legislature. They sometimes take some back. They sometimes give some back. It's their power. 
That's all I'm saying. That's well, the source of the power. Whether they decide to do this or not, I, I have no expressed no view today on the merits of your proposal. But whether they, I'm just trying to understand the political theory mm -hmm. behind this, and it's whether they decide that they want the legislature to have this power or a commission or to do it in some other fashion. Mm -hmm. All power in our state and in our nation is derived from the people, right? All and political the, and, power. And, and the people did not give it to the legislature. In 1963, the people gave it to a slightly differently formulated commission, and it was set up to try to be nonpartisan. Four members from each of the two major parties. If there's 25% or more of the vote that votes for a third party, well, they get to have a voice, too, on the commission. And that was how it was operating until 1982, when this court, based on United States Supreme Court precedent, <laughs> Reynolds versus Sims, says the criteria that were set forth in the Constitution cannot be used. Our United States Supreme Court has said that violates the Equal Protection Clause, so those criteria can't be used. And as a result of that, because it was not made severable, as, as our proposal does, the, the court said, this commission cannot operate because that is such an important part of it. And the reason it cannot operate anymore is because we cannot, th this court was unable to assume that the people of Michigan would have voted to set it up the way it was set up if they had known that they weren't going to be able to use that standard that was built into the Constitution. Now, th the legislature could have uh, tried to, to fix that if they had chosen to. They have the ability to propose an amendment to the Constitution. They, 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 they saw what was found to be uh, unsustainable. They could have proposed an amendment to the Constitution, but they didn't choose to. They chose to, in light of this court's decision that it could no longer use the commission, to take that for themselves. So that's, that's where the legislature got the ability to, to apportion. Uh, they, they, they took that and kept it for themselves. And now this proposes to put it back where the, uh, where the 63 Constitution put it, in a citizen's commission. And it is a little different. It's, it has been crafted in a way that is intended to ensure that it really is free of partisan political influence and to make sure that the membership is representative of all political persuasions. Uh, there, are, there are issues of specificity as to how it's to be set up, the criteria that are to be used, but those are all details. It's not, uh, th those are details. Uh, there is no authority either in the Constitution or in any precedence of this court to say that an amendment must be limited to a mere correction of detail. We've seen over the years that that has not been the case, and it should not be the case this time. I see that I'm out of time. I will answer any questions that any of you may have. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know. Do we have any further questions for plaintiff in this case, for the appellant? for Mr. Ellsworth, and I think he wanted some rebuttal right. time, so I'll open the floor to you. I, I think you wanted some rebuttal time anyway, so I'll invite you. Well, I did, and I, I don't know if I really have any time, but well, I... Let me, let me start with a question, then you can maybe go for there until they, until they turn off the lights. Um, the, uh, the question I have is, is it your position that um, redistricting and reapportionment in general cannot be changed by an initiative or... Uh, uh, an initiated amendment, or is it your position that this particular proposal uh, it cannot be done because of the particular nuances and details of this proposal? Uh, my answer would be this particular proposal. I think that, for example, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court, this court in 1982 recognized that historically there are building blocks that have gone, been in every constitution since uh, 1835 and even before that in the Northwest uh, Ordinance. Uh, drawing districts along political subdivision lines beginning with, with counties. I think if that structure were maintained, um, that it would be possible to set up a, a, a commission to administer that kind of criteria. I keep going back to the most fundamental problem that I have with this proposal, which is the lack of any firm criteria. The Constitution already has um, const the, 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 the political subdivision boundary line uh, 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 so, the, so, the people, so you agree, as, as we stated in that decision you just referenced, that the power to redistrict and reapportion uh, 
the legislature remains with the people. Do you agree with that? Yes. You, the, the, it's, the, it's the manner in which they, uh, this amendment purports to, to change, make those changes that you feel are objectionable. And if they had done it more in a manner that what, you agreed with or that some group agreed with? Or how do, you, how do we decide which, what, what things are inviolable and, and, and subject to change by the people? and which things cross the line. How do, how do I know that when I see it? This proposal sweeps away, what, 200 years or something worth of uh, constitutional criteria in terms of how redistricting should be done, and that's the, the, the drawing uh, districts along political subdivision lines. Um, and that, that criteria, those criteria were, were in place to limit the discretion of map drawers, and as this Supreme Court uh, recognized in 1982, to limit the ability to jury matter. So to me, the most fundamental problem, and I keep going back to the test that I think is there, I don't think it's single object or, uh, or anything other than the fact that you're, you're making a fundamental change in, in, in the Michigan Constitution, one that re reverses, I don't know, 1835, I don't know how many years back then it was, but it's a long time ago, and all that's wiped away by this proposal. May I just touch on the, the other uh, issue? Okay, I just want to make sure I, we're, we're, I'm focused in on this. So it, it's not the nature of the change, it's the degree of change that, that you object to. Is that right? This, the, the people, you agree, the people have this power. They can change redistricting, they can do it by amendment, no problem. It's just you can't do it like this. Well, it's the it, it, yes, it's the it's the nature and it's the it's the departure from the existing the text. Well, the whole of the, idea they're going to make changes. Uh, it's going to change from what was there before, right? And they're, and they're, whole, they're not going to have a whole amendment and then say, well, we like it, but we'll you know keep it all, but just make one little thing, right? They're going to change something significant, right? Well, they're going to change something, but this is a this is a sweeping radical change that wipes away you know since 1835. And you yeah. trust you trust seven people to always decide where that the line is between you know, it, sweeping and not. It, I, it, I, I know you don't. No, you're not putting you aside, your client doesn't like this particular one. The next one they might really really like. Are you sure you want to let us crush it? It is not an easy not line. Like it's tomorrow. not an easy line to draw. I acknowledge that. But could you, for example, have an amendment? Let me keep it real simple. Could you have a an amendment that says that we will uh, no longer have three branches of government. From now on, we're going to have a, we're going to have a monarch. We're going to have a king or a super queen. Super governor. We, we established the, the office of super governor. The super governor gets yes. to um, overrule every decision by every other branch. Yes. Can you do that? And my my answer would be no. It would through the amendment process. I might be crazy, my answer might be yes. I think the people will probably vote it down because I trust the people, but I, I, don't know that my, I don't know that I get to be the one that says they decide this or that. Based on the language in the Constitution, I, I have to say, I'm not, I didn't grow up in Michigan, so I had to read all this and learn it, and I was like, <laughs> wow, the Michigan people did something unique here, right? Um, it's not, not every state has this kind of power, or has given this kind of power to the people to change their government, but apparently they did. They, I think they can vote, vote this court out of business. I'm glad that Mr. Crabtree mentioned the 100 word um, uh, description limitation and I, I, I meant to mention that as, as one, of the, uh, one of the textual uh, limitations on what, what you can do and I think that again is an indication that, that the framers uh, expected amendments, amendments to be simple, something that you can describe in very few words uh, and let the people understand. Uh, may I just have a couple of minutes to, to address the other issue Mr. Uh, Crabtree uh, touched on, and that's the abrogation issue, because I think there's an important uh, problem here with what the Court of Appeals did. This court in 19, uh, uh, 2012, I think it was, in, in the Protect Our Jobs case, clarified and, and, and simplified the test for determining whether a, a section of the Constitution has been abrogated. The court said that an abrogation occurs if, if there is any uh, nullification of anything in that section. It can be a word, a sentence, a clause. Uh, it doesn't matter how small. The Court of Appeals below misapplied that decision and said it doesn't matter. If it's a small change, uh, then it doesn't count as an abrogation and the, and the measure can go on the ballot. That was a, that, that, that's inconsistent with what this court did. If this court does not reverse the Court of Appeals on that point, then then your uh, decision to protect our jobs no longer is the law of the state. 
we gave you one example, and we, we discussed four in our briefs. I, we, we, we gave to uh, the clerk ahead of time a, um, a little summary, and I can read it uh, for Justice Bernstein of just one example of how. Well, we're uh, really going to have to call this to an end pretty quickly. I'm sorry, Your Honor. We're really going to have to call this to an end pretty quickly. I mean, you've but had he, it. He can read it, though. Well, I just want to, because I, I think this is so clearly an abrogation that uh, under, the, under the court's ruling. Article 9, Section 17 of the Constitution says no money shall be paid out of the state treasury except in pursuance of appropriations made by law. The VMP proposal in Article 4, proposed Article 4, Section 6, uh, uh, 6 says, and let me just read this. I, you've got, I hope, a handout but for Justice Bernstein. Uh, the state of Michigan shall indemnify commissioners for costs incurred if the legislature does not appropriate sufficient funds to cover costs. An, ind an indemnification is the state treasurer writing a check. And this proposal says that check is written if no appropriation or if an insufficient appropriation is made. That is an abrogation of Article 9, Section 17, and it should have been published in the petition, and the fact that it was not is fatal. Are there any further questions? What if, it, what if the office of super governor was to be held by Peter Ellsworth? Could they do that? That's OK. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. We stand adjourned.